You're now listening to Directing Magic with your host, Marquette Jones. Hello, this is Marquette Jones, and you're listening to the Directing Magic Podcast. I'm so privileged to have um, a new guest in today, um, veteran filmmaker, Miss Valerie Red Horse Mole. Had to get that right um, because she's been around the independent filmmaking community for so long and doing really fantastic work. And her new documentary is called Man Killer. And it's about uh, Wilman P. Mankiller. Um, And could you please tell us more about that film? Absolutely. And thank you for having me on today. This is a pleasure and an honor. So Wilma Mankiller was the first female elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, which is one of the most powerful American Indian tribes in the country. Um, And when she was elected in 1983, initially as their deputy chief, Um, She was barely elected. Um, Her ticket won by 50.3%. And she was subjected to extreme sexism. Just unbelievable. And she just looked at it with um, strong will and uh, humility and moved forward in grace and integrity and was elected and went on to win two more terms. And the margin changed quite a lot by the time she was elected the second time, right? That's right. Um, For her third term, where she was elected, her her first term, she actually had to um, step in for a principal chief that had stepped down. So that one was um, not technically an election. And then she had two more elections. And her final election in 1991, she won by 82%. Wow. So clearly everyone... That would never happen (laughs) in the United States anytime soon. Well, and it it was interesting when Bill Clinton uh, awarded her the Medal of Freedom. uh, He he joked about that because he hadn't had quite those good of numbers. (laughs) But yeah, she she really proved herself with hard work. And her story uh, is one that is so relevant today. Uh, It's not just a biography of a strong woman. I mean, that's enough. That's plenty. But it's also of someone that believed in servant leadership and uh, was a uniter and really, really um, did not believe in divisive politics or partisan politics. And so uh, Gail Ann Hurd, my executive producer, and I uh, who are both women filmmakers, obviously, just believe this message is not just um, entertainment. It's actually really necessary. It's like a wake-up call. Uh, America and the world really needs to see it. What do you think Miss um, Mankiller would say about the politics that are going on now in our culture? I think she'd be very sad. Mm-hmm. Wilma was someone who had a quiet dignity about her, and she would get angry about things, but she never yelled. She would just fix them. And I think anytime she saw injustice or people marginalized or people persecuted, um, she became very sad and she spoke out against it. But more than that, she was a woman of action and she would do something to fix it and change it. And so I think she would probably do everything in her power to get us back to center, to get us back to civility and Mm. and, uh, respect for one another. Um, so you as a filmmaker, what attracted you to this particular subject? Well, I myself am Cherokee. I'm I'm what's okay. called an urban Cherokee. I have never lived um, in Oklahoma with my people. My father was brought out to California on a almost forced relocation program where they took Indian men from Oklahoma and sent them into San Francisco. And what's interesting is Wilma's father had the same experience. Their whole family was relocated to San Francisco. So why were they relocated? It was a Bureau of Indian Affairs program designed to help um, with economic development because there was a, a severe unemployment on the reservation. So instead of trying to bring economic development into their home and their community, they just kind of picked up families and moved them. Mm-hmm. And it, it was technically optional, but there usually was no other choice or you would lose your home and you would have absolutely no means of survival. So was there job training when people um, were moved out to California? No, that that's one of the problems and one of the major flaws of the program. It pretty much was a, a, a failed program where they just relocated Indian people into mm-hmm. big cities and then the support really wasn't there. And in the film, Wilma points out that 
um, a lot of the support she found was from, you know, like the American Indian Center on the corner, which was just a grassroots organization. And that's sort of the beauty of her San Francisco experience is she became involved with the Black Panthers and the women's movement and the American Indian movement. And it was just an exciting time, even though the way she got there was rather sad. Mm -hmm. Um, She really soaked up what it meant to sort of reawaken and understand grassroots organization and and the ability to make a difference and have a voice. Mm -hmm. And she ended up years later taking that back to Oklahoma. And that's what she applied to a very successful leadership strategy. Wasn't she a part of the... um I don't know. Would you call it an occupation? The event? Alcatraz yeah. occupation. Absolutely. Yes. I, I well, went to school in the Bay Area, so I'm like, no, she's famous. We got to talk about her. <laughs> the The Alcatraz occupation is covered. It's it's a big section in our film, for an hour film anyway. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was one of my favorite sections because going back to San Francisco and filming, and um, we were able to use a CCR song because she had used CCR's boat to get out to Alcatraz. And CCR is C- Credence Clearwater Revival, the gotcha. the music music band, and and we used um, with their permission, obviously, the song "Fortunate Son," which was mm-hmm. that from that era. So it's an exciting part of the film uh, in that it really establishes that voice, I think, of of our Indian community. And yeah, it was it took place in the late '60s, and a group of Indians from the American Indian Centers in Oakland and San Francisco and the whole Bay Area basically occupied Alcatraz because there was a federal law on the books that said any federal land that was formerly American Indian land, if it went unused oh. and became vacant, then it should revert to Indian ownership or Indian territory. Territory, And that had been the Ohlone um, land. Those are the Indians indigenous to the San Francisco area. And of course, the federal government didn't recognize that particular law. Um, but the American Indians of of that time and that era knew that if they were going to start to get some rights, they needed to do something that was visible. And, uh, you know, they, they made a difference. They didn't get the land at, in the end of the day, but uh, Nixon, who was in office at the time, actually passed some laws in response to that, that, oh, really? that helped with treaty rights and land rights for tribes. So I view it as a very successful undertaking. And so outside of, um, I guess her, I think one of the things that I really like about the way you structure the documentary is that you really start from beginning and take us all the way through. Um, she passed away in 2010, but just seeing the legacy that she left behind through the people that she cared about and the changes that she made within within her community, wherever she was, like whether it was in the Bay Area or back home in Oklahoma is really, really cool. Um, so one of the things that I was curious about from a filmmaking perspective is how long did it take you to pull all of those like archival resources that you include in the film? You know, that's that's a great question. And it's a really interesting question for me as a filmmaker. And I am I have been called a veteran filmmaker. I think that just means I'm old. But um, when I look back, I know you're a narrative filmmaker. Yeah. And when I look back, my first film was a narrative from a screenplay that I wrote. And I feel that it's so much easier in the sense you have a roadmap, you have mm-hmm. a Bible, you, because you have a screenplay, mm-hmm. and that's what you're going to film. With a documentary, you have an outline and you have an idea of the topics you want to cover, but you have no idea where all the material is and what people are going to say and where the film is going to go. There might be tangential things that come up that are really interesting and you have to follow. So to me, it's much more exciting because it's like organic. It's Mm -hmm. almost like a living script, but it's also very hard to budget and plan. And on all of our documentaries, Gail and I have made three feature length documentaries and on every single one it's taken multiple years for one thing Mm -hmm. multiple budgets meaning you kind of finish one research and development budget and then you go back and then you get the second half and then you get more here and um, on this one Gail actually helped uh, with a kickstarter campaign because we didn't have all the funding we needed and you know to your specific point uh, the archival footage is really your largest line item in a, in a film like this. And mm-hmm. we didn't know where we were going to find it. So we had to have some very strong research 
um, people on our team and we all rolled up our sleeves and my daughter was in high school at the time. She's now in college, but um, she and, and one of her, you put her to work. We put her to work as, <laughs> as PAs in my office and they found some stuff that we had missed. Mm-hmm. So um, there was no stone uncovered and uh, it, it um, was interesting to me how different the process was for this subject, because mm-hmm. when we did the other two, they were military stories. And so you pretty much were going to the National Archives and you right. still had to dig, but you kind of knew where everything was. This, we had stuff from CNN and CBS and obviously um, the White House when she got her award. And we also had home movies from people in the community in the Cherokee territory. So it was vast and just so interesting. But a little difficult format wise, you know, and even just to keep track of it all once you gather it, like how do you know how how to organize it like, right the well, the post production supervisor and the you know research team have nice. to do spreadsheets that mm-hmm. um are very complex, and the editor you know weighs in and you have time code and licensing and it it's st- it is a very daunting task so your this was partially funded by p m s Right. It, it's technically a film for PBS. It will be broadcast um, in March of 2018 on PBS. And our funding came from the Native American division. That I say division. I don't know if that's the technical term, but um, Vision Maker Media. Mm-hmm. And, and so they gave us the grant for the research and development, and then they gave us a grant for production. But the money, and they, they say this to you, they recognize their money is not intended to cover 100% of your budget. You're then supposed to go out and find other grants and matching funds. And Gail and I talked about it, and that process takes so long. She basically said, let's you know try Kickstarter, which is crowdfunding. And I knew nothing about that. And the beauty and sort of irony and, and wonderful connection here is that she's the executive producer of The Walking Dead, which I believe is the number one watch show on television. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. she has, I don't know how many thousands of followers on Twitter and social media. She probably has more than a few thousand. Yeah, yeah. she she's definitely just well known. And um, and she was well known before The Walking Dead. But so she I did, looked at her bio and... I it's mean, exhausting. It, it <laughs> she's <really> amazing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. Well, she... That's one impressive. of one of her early films um, was The Terminator, and that remains like one of my favorite. When I saw Sarah yeah. Connor, just you know, strong woman back in, I think that was the eighties. I, I love that film, and mm-hmm. and we talk often about her characters, even if they're in some sort of sci fi environment. It's the same. She always looks for ordinary people doing mm-hmm. extraordinary things, and so Wilma fits right into her. Um, her theme that that she likes to focus on, but um, but anyway, the the Walking Dead fans really stepped up. We had over a thousand donations uh, at different varying amounts, from a mm-hmm. dollar to ten thousand, and it covered our budget. Uh, I did have, I think, ten of my friends made donations, and all the rest <laughs> were the Walking Dead fans. So it was it was very interesting, and and some of the Walking Dead actors became involved in our campaign on, in the video, and they came to the screening. So it's been a wonderful relationship. And you just had your was it your LA premiere or your world premiere? It was our world premiere awesome. at the Los Angeles Film Festival. It was a wonderful venue. Um, I I really liked how they recognize the importance of the message um, and beyond the premiere and the screening of the film they had me on a female filmmaker panel they had me on a diverse voices panel about mm-hmm. minorities in film and I felt like it, there was just attention to how you know how our voices are important in in the film community and that was great to feel embraced like that what um what where is the film go next from from Los Angeles between now and our March 2018 mm-hmm. broadcast, uh, we plan to do a fairly extensive festival screening schedule. Um, our next one on the books is in August, on August 15th, at the um, National Museum of American Indian Smithsonian nice. Native, Native Cinema Showcase, but it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, so, I yeah. thought you were going to say D.C. We are planning a Washington, D.C. <laughs> screening as well, but the very next one will be in New Mexico. Um, we're looking at October for the Washington, D.C. screening, and that's probably going to be several different nights of screenings for different types of audiences. Mm-hmm. And then um, 
We have some other invitations that we're locking down, but some could be international, it looks like. And so we're we're excited. I, I have to check my passport, I think, to make sure I'm up to date. It's, it's going to be a rough travel schedule, but I think it's going to be very, very rewarding and exciting. And then we also, for the first time um, that I, I believe it, the first time in our filmmaking, uh, we have an educational distributor signed on board. Okay. And we felt that was really important. For this one, I yeah. agree. I mean, you didn't ask my opinion, but I no, I, I, I <laughs> I I knew of her from college, from my college days in, in the Bay Area. But then I, when I saw the documentary, I'm like, yeah, we haven't been talking about her just in the collective in a little while. I'm really glad that this is coming out so people can become aware of her again. Yeah, it's very frustrating for us. I mean, there's so many American Indian topics that just are kind of invisible. And we talked a little bit about that on that diversity panel that... Um, we're not only anti-stereotypes in the media and in film portrayals, but for the most part, we're kind of absent. And we, yeah. we need uh, more education, more exposure. And, and she is someone that should be taught. I mean, everyone should know her. And there was um, a lot of attention given to her when there was that $20 bill campaign mm-hmm. to get Andrew Jackson off uh, the bill. And um, I thought it was a very wonderful thought and wonderful movement. I don't think it went anywhere, but mm-hmm. um, it, it brought attention to Wilma, and mm-hmm. I hope our film will really uh, bring a lot more. Her name should be known, and with the educational distributor, what's nice about that is they have the ability to get this screened and discussed in almost every major university. It doesn't even have to be a major university. I mean, of course, they will look at, you know, the Stanford's and Harvard's and Princeton, those types of schools, but then also community colleges around the country and even community centers, you know, just so that this is widely viewed. And it also will have um, teacher and viewer like guides materials. and mm-hmm. materials. Yeah. What about when you when you say her name, what do you want people to know most about her? I think Wilma left a legacy that we need to remember. And what really touched me was her gentleness, Mm -hmm. but her strength. So I think right now in the world, there's a perception that in order to be strong and powerful, you somehow have to be mean and nasty and yell at people. And that couldn't be furthest from the truth. And she was so successful in bringing economic development and gaming and redoing the medical system and the educational system. So she had scorecard, you know, she did wonderful things, but she did it quietly with dignity and loved everyone around her. And when she got mad, she didn't get angry at people. She just went about her way of making a change and a difference. So I think we need to really think about Wilma's style of leadership and get back to that civility. Mm. And for you as a filmmaker, did you learn anything new um, process-wise while you were making this one? I have learned that it is much harder to do films about people that are no longer living, and yet we seem to keep doing that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I learned from every one of my subjects. So I learned a lot from the Code Talkers when we did the World War One and World War Two, And from this, I can honestly say I learned from Wilma. Um, I read her autobiography probably 12 times and read other things that she had written and talked to her family. And I talked to everyone that I could find that knew her and worked with her. And I really learned the meaning of working through challenges and not complaining because the other part we haven't mentioned is she did all of this while being terribly, terribly ill. She had kidney disease from an early age. She was diagnosed with a disease that I have a problem pronouncing. It's like myasthenia gravatus or something. I've completely massacred that. But point being, she, and then she was in a car accident and she had like 17 broken bones. And so many times I would just look at her story and think many people would have just gone to bed, you know, and she didn't waver. She didn't stop. And I really learned what I think is the meaning of strength from her. Mm -hmm. And I know there are days when I feel tired and I think, oh, I can't do something. And then I think about her and think, and I don't have any of those, you know, I'm just, I'm getting a little old, but I don't have any of those um, illnesses. And so she really, I really learned strength from Wilma. Mm. Do you feel, one of the things that I really enjoyed, just uh, personal, but (laughs) um, I love the love story in this film. Yes. 
I really, really do. I'm like, yeah, we need more of that kind of guy. I think it's a good message for women because she had a failed first marriage and she had beautiful kids as a result of that. And I have so many friends that have either broken up with their first love or divorce, you know, there's something. And there's a point of feeling a little depressed about that. And now I'm never going to find the right person. Now I'm getting old. And she, she really went on with her life and Mm -hmm. she took her girls and she got a job and she was, you know, when she first moved back to Oklahoma, she was living in her car and uh, it was hard for her. And, and Gloria Steinem comments that uh, it was hard but but and where most people would have viewed it as a challenge, uh, I think Wilma viewed it as an exciting turning point. So she had this incredible attitude. But then she met Charlie, to your point, uh, much later in life, and they fell in love, and they were just uh, the perfect couple, and clearly just the love of each other's lives. So I think it's an important message for women that feel, oh, you know, I'm, I've gone through a divorce or I've gone through a nasty breakup. And the mm-hmm. message is, you know, there's probably someone else out there and just be who's patient. pretty awesome and who's going to love all of your parts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, for, for you personally, for your bio, I noticed that you run an investment group. Is that right? I, well, I'm an investment banker. So, banker. Okay. Yeah, I have an investment bank. So <laughs> this is how, from the outside, it looked. It looked like, hey, I'm a beautiful, you know, movie star type of chick, but I'm actually, you know, smarter than that. I'm going to go make movies. Oh, wait. So you mean I have to ask somebody else to make movies? Why don't I just get my own money and then I'm going to just have all the money and I'll make whatever I want. That's how you look from the outside. <laughs> well, it doesn't work quite like that. But <laughs> but to your point, I, I realized early on that making a living and paying the bills and raising kids um, on the salary of an independent filmmaker was probably not realistic. Mm-hmm. And I actually love math and economics. And I had a chance to intern when I was young for a big investment bank. And I really saw that this was something needed in the Indian community. So yes, I I created my own investment bank in 97, around the same time I was working on my first film and pregnant with my third child. So I was a little crazy, I think. Busy. Busy. (laughs) um, But I had energy back then. I was young. Um, But it's it's been a real blessing because um, not only has it provided that salary to pay my bills and um, the free and flexibility to make films where I may not be getting paid a lot. and But also it allows me to really understand my tribal community. I've worked with mm-hmm. over 100 tribes and some of them have a lot of money from gaming and some have nothing and I'm looking at other ways of bringing in econo- economic development. And so in some ways I'm doing similar things to what Wilma did for, for the Cherokee people. I'm just working with a lot of different tribes and so I really enjoy being kind of left brain, right brain at the same time. And um, I think Gail and I both recognize, you know, we have other jobs mm-hmm. that are, are the bulk of our income. And then we do this, these documentary films kind of for the love of the topic and the passion for social change and social impact. Um, and it's it's been rewarding. And I think we both feel blessed that we have that ability. And are you um, planning any other documentaries? I have two documentaries, treatments, uh, proposals on my desk right now, and I have two screenplays that are narrative on my desk, and uh, I feel like we're going to get all of them done. How I'm going to do it all, I don't know, but I just pray and let God figure that out. It's really fantastic. I love the fact that you're so diverse in the things that you're, like, like you said, left brain, right brain. I think that's actually a lot of people who are attracted to filmmaking. I, th- I think so, too. And, and people who are editors, you know, you have to have the creative side, but you have to have the technical side. Almost everyone I know that's successful has that ability. And every parent I know, if you're raising <laughs> kids, you've got to have a little of both. So I think it's just, you know, being a, uh, being an active person, you develop that. So if people wanted to find um, Man Killer, the documentary, or any of your past work, where would they go? Well, the best place for Man Killer is mankillerdoc.com. Um, you, if you Google Man Killer, you know, it'll come up. We have a really good um, press um, gal, Lindsay Miller, who um, puts everything on the website. So mm-hmm. any uh, announcements, any screenings. Um, she's also created a Twitter handle and I think a Facebook page. And these are things that I'm too old to really understand. But <laughs> um, you'll find them all there. There'll be links. And 
up-to-date information. And then my personal website is ValerieRedHorse.com, and it has some info on my past films, um, but it also has a link to email me directly. So nice. if you have questions and want to see my old films or something, just reach Or if reach you want to bring Man Killer to your campus. You exactly, know, um, exactly. You know, reach out. Awesome. Um, and then I always like to ask people, what are you excited about right now that's not film-related? I am excited about beach volleyball. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know that just came out of left field and you're looking at me like, I haven't heard that. One. No. Um, so the most rewarding thing I've ever done is be a mother. It's a privilege to me to be mother to my three children, and they're all equally amazing. Um, but the two older ones think that I am giving preference to the baby right now, and I might be only because... <laughs> She just um, finished her freshman year at Stanford University, mm -hmm. and she's on the beach volleyball team for Stanford. And she's got an eye to maybe look at the Olympics someday. Her coaches are all Olympians or former, current or former Olympians. And mm -hmm. I love nothing better than to sit on the Stanford campus and watch her play and my husband at my side. And it is it is just so fun. Now, I went to UCLA, so I'm technically a Bruin, but it all goes out the window and I become a Stanford crazy Mother dance mother. mom she calls me <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i know about dance moms so that's really funny <laughs> i know just because i'm painted in the colors yes. and i know every one of her partners and their history and what the other teams are scoring and who she should look wow. out for you know i'm that person but i just love it and she's just she's beautiful and amazing as are my other kids um, but it's just fun right now to be able to watch beach volleyball and is that, um, when is, what is the season for beach volleyball? Well, like? she practices year round, but the actual season is the spring. Um, her first game this year was in March. Gotcha. And we actually moved from LA up into the Bay Area to follow her and watch her. And so people are laughing that I'm stalking my daughter, but. <laughs> Dance mom. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Um, well, thank you so much for coming in. That was a great way to end. Um, so we will look out for, what is her name if you want to be a fan? of her sure it's chelsea red horse mole she uses her full name mm -hmm. and she's number two on stanford's beach volleyball team and their website's really comprehensive about the schedule of where they play and they, they play down in la quite a bit usc happens to be the number one team but we plan to change that so. i wish you guys could have seen her face it was like <laughs> i mean for now <laughs> they are for now but anyway thank you so much for being here and again everybody the man killer documentary can be found at man killer doc.com and uh red horse valerie red horse.com valerie red horse.com thanks thank you so much thank you you've been listening to directing magic with marquette jones be sure to visit directingmagic.com for past episodes and other information relating to the show also be sure to subscribe and rate and comment on itunes until next time bye bye